Welcome in, everybody. Another nice new edition of Celtics Beat. Adam Kaufman, of course, our producer, Evan Valenti. Ian Thompson, good friend of the program. And uh, Ian, how are you? Hope you're staying safe. Yeah, doing the best I can, like everybody. But yeah, all, all the news is good here. I appreciate it, Evan. Evan. Thank you. So this particular show, and uh, I feel like I need to warn people, you know, right off the hop. But generally, of course, it's a very Celtics focused show. It's, I mean, no kidding. It's called Celtics Beat. But there are peripheral things that certainly affect the seas not unlike this huge james harden trade going from houston to brooklyn impacting potentially the hierarchy of that eastern conference so we're going to get into all that not to mention the fact and this is a good place to start i think guys the seas haven't played in more than a week at this point in time now the latest update as i chat Right now with all of you, and I know depending on when you're listening, if you don't listen for a few days, things get old in a hurry. Celtics are expected to play tomorrow night, Friday night, hosting the Orlando Magic. Orlando has traveled to Boston after having a postponed game on Wednesday. The last three C's games have been postponed as a result of the NBA's health and safety protocols. First, there was the game against the Heat, where technically Miami didn't have enough players, even though the Celtics were down to the minimum eight. Miami had seven. You need to have eight, according to NBA rules to play a game and then it was on the seas they couldn't play in chicago because they had an eighth player go into the COVID protocols same case against orlando that next time around and so three straight games but the team is practicing today they are getting healthier there are multiple players that have tested positive jason tatum robert williams among them so many others that are in the COVID protocols but you know as, as much as people were all excited to see taco fall playing 25 minutes a night and peyton pritchard starting and and just raining threes like you read about sees hopefully and we have no grasp of this as we talk at this moment but hopefully are going to be a little more equipped for this next game I just you know bigger picture Ian with all the postponements Celtics heavily you know one of the teams that that has been you know at the at the center of of this outbreak within the league after everything went so perfectly in the bubble last year and this was not totally unanticipated here if that's even a word there are a number of games that have been postponed, a number of teams that have been afflicted by this situation. New COVID protocols have been impl implemented by the league. How close are we to a potential stoppage if this doesn't work over the next couple of weeks? Well, first of all, I'm sure like, like you guys, my first thought is just, I hope everybody that has caught it recovers from it. Mm -hmm. No long-term effects. You saw what happened with the pitcher from the Red Sox. Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez sure. developed heart problems, which tens of thousands of people in the U.S. and around the world, they're, they're suffering from all sorts of long-term problems with this disease. So you just hope that anybody that's caught it, that it's not that, that they're, that they're going to be okay, that everybody's going to be all right. That, that's the first thought. I think that's, that's been a real takeaway from this whole thing is just stabilizing your point of view, what really matters in life, you know, and if everybody is okay, then yeah, that, that will be a big thing for the Celtics because they have big hopes, big dreams for the season. Um, the way I'm looking at with this, the news of the, the vaccines coming out, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, NBA players shouldn't jump the line because of their celebrity or whatever. I'm looking at it from the totally opposite point of view. When Joe Biden comes in as president, he's looking, he's made it clear he wants to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. And he's gonna be looking for role models in different communities to try to convince people to accept the vaccine. And we all know the black communities in the US have been especially vulnerable to, to this disease. And there's a lot for very good reason. There's a lot of uh, uh, suspicion about the vaccine in those communities I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if the Biden administration goes to the NBA and says, can we please vaccinate your entire league right away? Because how many vaccines would that cost? That would be about 1,500 people, right? 1,000 to 1,500, including 500 players and, and coaches and other people that work on the edges. And then vaccinate everybody and then send them out and show the public, okay, Last time they got through their season, it was in a bubble with no one around. This time, let's see how the NBA does after everyone's been vaccinated. Will games be canceled after they've been vaccinated? I'm guessing they won't be. Um, you know, the, the NBA has made it clear they're not going to um, uh, force 
players or people to accept the vaccine. And even that might tell a story to the public. Look at the, the people who are vaccinated versus those who aren't. Which ones are able to play versus who can't play. I just think the, the, the new administration, the Biden administration, they're gonna be looking for all sorts of storytelling methods to try to get people to be vaccinated. And this seems like a no brainer to me. And so I, I, really, I really think that help is going to be on the way um, relatively soon for the entire league. It just makes sense to me. I just can't believe there was, uh, sorry, I was, I was going to say, I, I can't believe that among the new protocols that there wasn't already a rule about players not having, you know, non-team personnel in their hotel rooms when they're on the road. And I get we're talking about, you know, a, a lot of, you know, young, mostly single guys that, uh, you know, ha have a right to, you know, do what they want to do. At the same time, though, just from a, from a health and safety protocol standpoint, wanting to remove any and all risk as much as possible, short of, you know, truly bubbling up guys within their specific markets and communities it's uh, i don't know that that seems like a really easy area to say you know what don't do that right now i know it's going to be difficult but try and restrain yourselves and yet you know here we are maybe there was an idea like why why write out rules that are absolutely certain to be broken right <laughs> that's a good a point lot of history on that subject right there yeah evan you were saying well, I mean, if you're going to try and vaccinate the whole league, you're probably going to, you know, have to shut it down just so you can have a vaccination. I mean, this is a two-part process. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, you know, the, the black community might be a little skeptical. And I think a lot of people around the country are, are a little skeptical of this whole thing. Um, just in terms of like, if it works or not, you know, because the process in which these things were rolled out was a little rushed, but for good reason, right? Because we have a massive problem in our hands. Um, I, 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 when it comes to a shutdown, I, I don't just don't know how you're know, plowing through this thing, right. And trying to get like some sort of herd immunity here or trying to just plow through it because the RSNs, you know, have contractual obligations to the league. They have to do this, you know, they have to show so many games, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I get all the, the financial, you know, reasonings behind it. Um, but there's, there has to be like a health and safety, you know, uh, sort of, thing going on here in terms of, you know, we have to make sure that these players are as healthy as humanly possible. I mean, this, I mean, people around the league were watching, you know, Washington go from team to team to team. And I'm not, you know, singling out the wizards, but it's just kind of what happened where the Wiz would go to some team. And all of a sudden, a couple of days later, they'd have to shut down because they have a couple of positive tests. And what you're seeing in real time is how this particular virus can spread so quickly and affect so many people and a lot of money in a short amount of time. And in order for this lead to get really get back on track and to get like, cause you're playing regular season games. And I know like, you know, it's the regular season, whatever, but when you already have a smaller season, they've already cut 10 games, get down to 72, you know, every single game matters a little bit more, right. And you have a lot of teams that invested a lot of money. I'll throw the Atlanta Hawks out there and they're trying to make the playoffs this year, right. Atlanta stocked up on free agents, Danilo Gallinari. They got Bogdanovich as well. Um, they brought in Rondo to try and get that team over the hump into the playoffs. And if you're going to miss, you know, have some of your major players miss a week, two weeks because they've tested positive coronavirus, like that, that does hinder your ability to maybe make the playoffs later on. So, you know, I understand that people want, you know, this league to continue forward because there's so much stuff going on. But at the end of the day, the, the quality of the product becomes, you know, not as good when you have, you look at the Celtics roster, right? The other night, if they had played against Miami, it was, it was what T could play. They cleared him to play. Pritchard was, was, uh, was the backup guard. I think Tremont waters was there, but I think they had two players over six, five. And one of them was Taco <laughs> Paul and the other one was Aaron Neesmith. I mean that to watch a team go out there and try and play another team with, <laughs> with two guys over. I mean, it would have been somewhat entertaining, but it's not the, the same product that we're all used to. And I think at some point, you have to look at this thing and say, like, look, for the health and safety of everybody in this league, we might have to take a break for two weeks, three weeks, just to get this thing under control and get back to work again. I mean, I, I just, I have a hard time seeing how this doesn't, you know, uh, if you value your player's health and safety, how you can't shut this down just for a little bit at a certain point to get everything back on track. And that's why we haven't seen the second half of the schedule yet, because they're they're kind of kind of plan on this happening. This is this was going to be a smooth rollout. And if it if it was, it would have been a complete miracle. But they, they did this on purpose so that, you know, in case 
something bad happened like this, they can at least recover later on. I mean, it's just, it feels like we're headed that way, Ian. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. The, the most important thing is the health of people. That's, that's what matters most here. If you can, if you can run your league while, while maintaining the health of people, then yes. Um, it's interesting, Evan, the, uh, the idea of um, shutting down to get the vaccine, um, I, am, I, I haven't really heard of that. Like people who are getting the vaccine now, doctors, they're still, when they get the first dose, they still go back to work and they're still working in the mm. hospitals. So I, I would think, you know, an NBA player gets his first dose of the vaccine and then three weeks later gets the second dose. In the meantime, he's continuing to do his job in between. You know, I don't think you'd have to shut I don't think you necessarily have to shut down the league for three weeks to administer all these vaccines. And again, I'm, I'm only saying this as a possibility if it's something that the new presidential administration wants to do uh, in their hope of blanketing the country with vaccinations. And um, it's, going to be, it's, it's going to be a big story what's going to happen in the, in the black communities of America as far as the vaccine, there's a lot of bad history there. And um, the intentions of, of the new administration are gonna be all good. Let's try to protect as many people as we can from this virus. And so that, that would just, I just would think among the many different groups, and look, the, the black community isn't gonna be the only group that, that the, the Biden administration is gonna be trying to reach out to. There's gonna be all sorts of different um, groups out there, communities out there, and there'll be different role models who will be asked to serve. Uh, just like Elvis Presley took the polio vaccine in 1956 after hmm. um, children were killed by a bad batch of it. They used Elvis Presley to try to show people it was safe. They, they photographed him right before he went on TV getting the vaccine. I think that's what um, the leaders of the U.S. are going to be asking people like NBA players to do. And that gives you hope that what has turned out to be a, a rollout for the NBA season, which has gone very badly, it gives you hope that maybe um, it won't be like this the whole season long. Because if it is, like you're saying, if it is, then what's the point? What's the point of it? It doesn't mean anything. Your team was just the lucky one. You got through it with the most number of players getting through, and we end up seeing the Phoenix Suns win the championship or something like that, you know, it, it just isn't, it's not worth doing. Um, but yeah, that's where, that's where I, I see it going. That's my most optimistic take on what might happen. Well, hopefully as you know, Ian has already talked about first and foremost, everybody gets healthy, doesn't have any, sub, you know, substantial significant side effects of the situation you hope in a perfect world you know most if not all these players are asymptomatic and not even you know feeling the effects that so many across the country are and that they can get back to work and play games and you know make a I mean they're making a living either way but uh, you know beyond the entertainment factor that we also selfishly care about hopefully obviously everybody's health and safety is paramount but uh, when it you know comes back to games must be played at least so long as there are enough personnel to do it and with the Celtics not having played more than a week they're sitting seven and three it's tops in the Eastern Conference just in terms of that record I'm not saying the Celtics are the best team in the Eastern Conference I don't think anybody believes that right now but they're in the mix you know certainly with the Bucks with the new look Nets who we'll talk about in a second uh, certainly the uh, Sixers are right there the Heat are right there the uh, Maybe the Raptors could propel themselves into that conversation. You've got, uh, you know, the, the Pacers as well, perhaps. But, you know, we know who the upper echelon teams are in the East. Let's talk about, and, and maybe for a while, folks, brace yourselves, uh, what is happening in Brooklyn? Because first off in Houston, James Harden, you know, put, put the nail in the coffin, the last straw after that loss to the Lakers the other night, said basically, you know, this is broken, it can't be fixed, and and – you know, walked off. He's the situation cannot be repaired. And so I think the Rockets that sped everything up, despite the reports that conversations trade, you know, conversations were already going on. I think that really accelerated the process. It became two teams trying to acquire James Harden. 
you know, willing to give up everything there was. The Celtics, Danny Ainge acknowledged this earlier today. Celtics were, you know, interested. They put feelers out. They did their due diligence. But ultimately, Ainge said that unanimously they decided price wasn't right. The timing wasn't right. It wasn't the right fit. They weren't going to do it, which I commend. I've said that so many times on this show over the last several weeks. You don't need James Harden. Don't chase after James Harden. God forbid you do so and give up Jalen Brown in the process. So I'm glad the Celtics are who they are and James Harden is elsewhere. He goes to Brooklyn instead of the Sixers. And this is what, Ian, I have been, for anyone that follows me on Twitter, Cheap plug, Adam M. Kaufman. I have been rooting for this for months, for months, for James Harden to wind up with the Nets, to give us our own NBA hard knocks. We this Everyone should get league pass. This should be must-watch television. If, in fact, Kyrie Irving ever decides to come back and play basketball again, these three guys on a team together with basically no bench is just fascinating to me, and I have a zillion thoughts, and I could talk for an hour by myself, but initial impressions from you, Ian, what are they? I mean, first of all, I, I just wonder if the, the Nets are being run by an entertainment producer rather than... Because, <laughs> is Jay-Z still there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is what you would put together if you just want... If you were more interested in your ratings or, you know, your social media and all that stuff. If you, if you were in an entertainment business without worrying about winning a championship, this is exactly what you would do. But I also understand why they did for basketball reasons. Um, they're all in on trying to win a championship. And I, I don't think without adding a third star that they could ever beat the Lakers. And that's what you have to do. You have to, if you're trying to win a championship this year, next year you're, you're imagining LeBron and Anthony Davis. And really they have, they have very good depth around those guys. Um, and right now LeBron's better than Durant and Anthony Davis is better than Kyrie Irving. So they, they weren't gonna win you know, health permitting, which we cannot take for granted right now. But all things being equal, they weren't good enough, uh, despite everything they've done to improve their team. Now, if somehow they can figure out a way to get Kyrie Irving to play again, and then get those three guys to play together at a high level, now they have a chance to be good enough. They have a chance to be better than the Lakers, because Kyrie gets to be the hero. He gets to be the third guy that puts them over the top. Um, I'm not sure that would be Kyrie's definition of hero. I don't know how they're going to do that, but yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't think that's what Kyrie's looking for. I mean, it just depends on all these things. There's so many factors. It depends what you want to believe is true. I mean, there was the report yesterday out of SNY, and I think signs have pointed to this, so I am inclined to believe it, that Kyrie Irving, one, his relationship with Kevin Durant has grown distant. Go figure. That happens with Kyrie everywhere he is. As soon as he gets, you know... into the inner workings of a team he grows distant his you know relationship wise with all of his teammates I don't care if they were best friends before they signed on together of course they've grown distant and uh, you know Mr. I don't think we have a head coach apparently is still furious with the organization about the Steve Nash hiring and you know the fact that he wasn't consulted in the process I just think to me I've said this before I've so I've always We've talked about this, Ian and Evan, all of us. I've always been inclined to believe the NBA is a player's league, which it is, and that talent wins out in the end, which with very rare exception, like the, you know, 04 Pistons, it does. You have the most talent, you win a championship. Generally, that's the bottom line. I have, in this new era of social media and personalities and and just the, the evolution of the NBA player as we know them in recent years, I have expanded that thought to which... Ultimately, it's not talent alone that wins out. Personality is a huge factor. Personality is the only thing that trumps talent to me. And what I mean by that is this. This team has the talent, even with no bench. Levert's gone. Allen's gone. They they have no real bigs other than Jordan. Like They have no bench, but they still have enough talent to win a championship. But I think they have, the, they have the personalities, these three in particular, Kevin Durant with the burner accounts on social media, Harden, who openly doesn't want to, you know, play defense one or, you know, work hard a lot of the time and doesn't want to share the ball. And, you know, Kyrie Irving, who doesn't even want to play basketball, it's not remotely a top priority of his and hasn't been happy in Brooklyn since his coming home video. These three personalities could sink this team to the tune of, 
you know, I think losing in the second round of the playoffs, that is my expectation. I had one person say to me yesterday, I wouldn't be surprised if they lose in the play in tournament. It is, it's just remarkable how all this could unfold. All the, all those things are possible. It could be incredibly bad and it, it could work out. It's, is it going to work out over the course of the entire season? Are they going to be a consistent championship contender all year long, especially with all the uh, disruptions that we're facing right now during the COVID period? So probably, definitely not. They're not going to be a consistent team, I don't think. But the way I'm going to watch them is I'm just going to keep my eyes on Kevin Durant. It's all going to revolve through, it's all going to roll, revolve around and run through Kevin Durant. This is going to be the test of his life. You know, all this talk that he went to Golden State and just cashed in on a, a pre-existing championship team, or that when he was in Oklahoma City, he deferred Russell Westbrook was the strong personality, the strong voice of that team. All that has to change right now. Uh, if Steve Nash wants to coach the team, he has to coach it through Kevin. He and Kevin, because they have that relationship. That's why Steve's there in the first place. So the way Popovich, and please forgive me for this uh, correlation, but the way Popovich worked through Tim Duncan, that's mm -hmm. what Steve Nash has to try to do with Kevin Durant. And so everything, Kevin, I'm thinking about, we should run this. What do you think? Yeah, I get it, but let's do it this way. Okay. And they agree between the two of them. Steve announces it to the team. This is what we're going to do. And then he trusts Kevin to be the enforcer. Kevin's the one that goes to Harden and says, look, this is what we're going to do. Kevin's the one, maybe with Harden's help or other people's help, he goes to Kyrie and brings him along. Kevin has to be the one that on defense sets the example. He's got to be a two-way player this year. He's got to be a, an incredible defender. He's got to guard the rim because he's great at that. He's got to be able to, to guard multiple positions. He's got to do it so that he can hold other people accountable. He's got to do what LeBron does every single day, what James Harden has never done and probably never will do. It's all got to run through Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's got to make it all happen. He's got to be the all everything. Um, clearly, with the burner accounts and all that, we know that he hated the way people reacted to his going to Gold State. Well, if you hated that, here's your opportunity. Because no one thinks this is going to work. And the only way it works is if you decide I'm going to make it work and I'm going to tirelessly do it and I'm going to take responsibility for everything. Again, that's why being the best player of a championship team in the NBA is the hardest thing to do in sports. You're responsible for everything. We've talked about this before. you got to do stuff that Tom Brady never had to worry about. Never had to worry about the culture of the team. Tom Brady didn't even play half the plays for his team. Kevin Durant's got to do everything. He's got to worry about what's going on in the locker room. He's got to make sure that Kyrie's on board. He has to make sure that Kyrie and James Harden are playing together. He has to make sure that Harden isn't just a statue on defense. He has to keep all the young guys involved. He's got to set the example and do every, everything he's telling people to do, he has to do first. He has to accept tough coaching from Steve Nash to, a, to embolden Steve Nash's position. He's just got, he's got to deal with the New York media. He's got to make sure that he's not seen at parties with his family, not wearing a mask. He's got to do everything. He's got to do everything for them. And if he does that, then they have a chance. If he doesn't, zero. They have no hope. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot about chemistry because, you know, you have all the talent in the world here on this team with three guys that, you know, are all worthy of winning. Well, two guys worthy of winning MVP, and Kyrie has been – uh, an incredible, you know, second banana to uh, on a finals team. So it's not like they have they don't have the talent and the experience to get there. I mean, Durant obviously with the title wins, that's big. But how does this team gel? And you mentioned it, you know, in with it's really all about Kevin Durant and how he handles both of these guys. And the one thing that I'm curious, you know, oh, you can talk about off the court, in the gym, et cetera, et cetera. I just these are two. High Is that Danny? Does yeah. Danny want to talk? I wish Danny want to get on the show. I love that. <laughs> Uh, but we have, you know, we have three high usage guys that all need the ball in their hands to be effective. I mean, James Harden's entire, you know, career in Houston is defined by he is the overlord seer of the entire offense. And when James Harden feels like getting the ball, he's going to, but most of the time he's going to take a bunch of shots and go to the free throw line a lot of times. Now you have two other guys that need the ball just as much as Harden does. I mean, again, Durant, you said is, and I've said this about Jason Tatum, Durant's going to have to defer to guys to get them involved and keep them engaged in the game. 
But at the end of the game, they have three guys that can close or maybe two and a half, depending on how you feel about Kyrie, but Kyrie's a great closer um, in terms of, you know, the, uh, who takes the final shot. I mean, it's going to take sacrifice. Howard Beck wrote an article, I think last week, detailing the sacrifice the 08 Celtics made, right? You know, Ray Allen, that's not what he signed up for, but he had to do what he had to do to win a championship, right? Can these guys make a sacrifice mid-season to gel and make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, the W is the most important thing? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm fascinated uh, how this team's going to work. I mean, the bench stuff, I mean, they might get killed on the glass in a lot of games. You look at that, that team in L.A., uh, they won last year primarily because of their size. I mean, they had – a bunch of bigs between JaVale McGee and Anthony Davis and, and Dwight Howard. And they had sparing minutes for other places, but they could go big and still beat teams. And this team's going to face, you know, some, some bigs eventually that can take advantage of that. So I, from a chemistry standpoint, I'm concerned from a, on the court standpoint, I'm concerned. It's going to be fun as hell to watch, like no question about it. It makes them the favorite quote unquote to come out of the Eastern conference, but you know, you're, you're, you're entrusting Kevin Durant in a role that maybe he's not um, all too comfortable with. Um, and Steve Nash has never coached a year in his life to, to handle this whole thing. And I'm not totally, totally convinced it is going to work out, especially when you have other teams that have a little bit more chemistry, although they don't have as much talent. So this is kind of the ultimate chemistry versus talent thing. Um, but I am thrilled to, that it happened because, you know, for the content only, per, like solely. I mean, the, the, the internet yesterday was unbelievable. And all the segments that have come out of it, you know, today and, you know, for the next couple of days are going to be tremendous. And that's just – and the game hasn't been played yet. When they finally play together, the content's going to be even better. So from a, from a content standpoint, I'm thrilled. But I, I, I don't know if it's going to work. And they're throwing a lot of eggs into a basket because if it doesn't work – uh, Houston owns every pick they have, you know, so yeah, four future picks and four pick swaps also. Yeah. It so, the hall. Yeah. It, hall. it better work because if it doesn't, this is catastrophic for the Nets. Ian, just building off what Evan's talking about. And obviously we want your thoughts. The, I, I just don't know, like Evan said, the great article by Howard Beck about, you know, players, superstars needing to defer and Ray Allen having to do so you know, more than anybody else in that team, but all three did. But the thing was, there was that common goal, you know, Garnett for all the years that he dominated in Minnesota, he didn't win a title. You know, he didn't win anything more than individual awards. Same for Pierce in Boston, same for Allen in Milwaukee and Seattle. This trio is different. You know, Kevin Garnett has won multiple championships. It's this, this isn't the same Kevin Garnett who left Oklahoma city. You know, Kyrie Irving hit the biggest shot in NBA Finals history, history, arguably, or one of them anyway. He has won a title, and he has long since proven and, and stated basketball is not the most important thing to him. And James Harden, I'm just not sure that ultimately he defines his what will eventually, you know, already is a Hall of Fame career based on whether or not he has a ring. And so I just don't know how these three come together, ultimately, who defers who sacrifices on an individual level and how they find that common goal other than trying to prove people wrong. But I'm not even so sure they hear the noise of we need to prove people wrong because I think they probably believe it's going to work. Yeah. It's the, the lesson of that uh, 2008 Celtics team. And it's the perfect example is that it just all, it all has to be intentional. It has to be their number one focus. I mean, from the very start, the first time Doc Rivers, he told me, the first time he got them together, um, the first thing he talked about was uh, respecting each other and not worrying about your own stats and deciding what the priority is. And he talked about it every day. He never let it go. He always talked about it. Uh, Garnett came out and uh, said, "Paul, this is Paul Pierce's team. Paul Pierce is the captain. This is his team. And he made sure that Paul Pierce was the leading scorer. He made sure that he deferred to him in terms of scoring. Um, it, it just went on and on. They went on that duck boat tour, you know, and pre before they'd even started playing mm -hmm. uh, to get them thinking about what the goal is and how they were going to do it. And even then, I remember being in the locker room uh, with them um, I think it was the second round against Cleveland and they had yet to win a road game in the playoffs. And you could just see the, the daggers flying between the eyes of, uh, of Ray Allen and, and Kevin Garnett. 
that night after they've lost yet again in Cleveland. And, the, you know, we all look back on that as, as such a, a glorious season for them. And it was all uh, kumbaya and all that stuff. And, but it wasn't, it was really hard. And that was after they'd been focused on all the time. So I mean, you're totally right. I mean, I, who knows if this is going to work? The, the, the default position should be that it isn't going to work. <laughs> and it's only going to work if they really work hard to make it work. They, they make it their number one focus. And that, to me, is why it all has to start with Durant. If he doesn't take charge, they have no chance of making it work. You know, I will say this, though. As far as a trade, if you think about the draft picks, um, I don't think, I don't think they gave up that much really because, okay, the swaps of picks, Houston is going to be bad for quite a while. I mean, it's clear their owner, um, is in a bad financial position right now and they've just dumped <clears throat> a ton of salary and I would think they're going to keep doing this. So I, I just think that they're, they're in a position where, um, when it's time to swap the pick, Houston's probably not going to want to swap. Well, I think, I, I think the question is, you know, to your point, like the, the picks aren't going to be that good if this works and Brooklyn is good, but you know, we're talking about the next couple of years. What does it look like four and five years from now when some of that pick flexibility or inherited picks still exist? What is Brooklyn going to look like? Because obviously, you know, last time around, it was very different, you know, in, in trading for an aging Kevin Garnett and a Paul Pierce. And I think if nothing else, this is a reminder of how bad that deal was with what they gave up in that package that flamed out in a hurry. I don't know how quickly this, I don't think this is going to work in terms of championship expectations really, but how quickly is it all going to combust? That is very pertinent to the draft picks. No, you're right. Down the line, it's like those big baseball contracts, right? Albert Pujols, you know, at the end, or even maybe Mookie Betts for all we know, you know, at the end, sure. you're going to regret those signings. And at the same time here, they're going to regret it. But clearly they're all in and they're operating on this new NBA timeline that exists for every team, but the Lakers or the Celtics, the Celtics have their young stars locked up for a number of years, which is unusual in the league today. The Lakers they know probably that those two guys aren't going anywhere, but everyone else in the league, when they get stars together now, they're, they're looking at a short window because they, it is combustible and volatile and you don't know how long these guys are going to stay together anymore. So um, yeah, they, they're all in, they have to make it work this year and next year, it could all go away and they could be left with nothing. If those guys do leave after two years, um, because the Nets gave away so much, they're going to have tons of cap space and they are going to be in New York and they were a destination for these stars. So maybe they're thinking we could, we could recruit more stars. Something I don't think Houston's ever going to be able to do with that owner. So um, I can just see from their point of view how they, they, they probably have some kind of algorithm going on in their head where they said, okay, if, we, if we're able to even if it doesn't work out, if we're able to replace those guys, maybe the draft picks don't really hurt us so much. Uh, they're going to be mid to late round picks every year, ours, and they're not And the Rockets probably aren't going to want to swap. And so they gave up Karis LeBert, Jared Allen, and, and a bunch of draft picks that aren't really worth much. And they believe in their ability to, to transform uh, guys who weren't picked high into players, which is the story of their success. It's why right now the odds makers say that the Nets are ahead of the Celtics, even though the Nets got bamboozled on that trade with Danny, they're still somehow ahead of the Celtics. So they probably have a lot of confidence in themselves that they can overcome just about anything. So uh, Ian, uh, you know, some people would probably like us to be done with the Nets. We're not done with the Nets yet because while we have glossed over it, we have mentioned it, we haven't uh, really taken a deep dive into it. And I only want to go so long on this, but Kyrie Irving, who is, uh, Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens must be thrilled that he is just no longer their problem. Quite frankly, is, is the simplest way I can put that. Steve Nash has to be beside himself that 12 games, 11 games into his head coaching career, he's being asked questions about whether Kyrie Irving, who's not injured, is going to come back and play again this season, period. The guy has just gone AWOL, breaking NBA protocols, off, you know, having massless birthday parties, lavish gatherings for his sister. And it's, I mean, the guy is, he is off the map, obviously. And, and we knew that 
That was always a possibility, but this thing has gone south in record time, even for Kyrie Irving for his time in Brooklyn. Now that he is finally paired with Kevin Durant, who missed all last season due to his injury. What I'm wondering is this Harden trade, because there were reports a couple weeks back that he was not in favor of a James Harden trade. Is this going to bring him back any faster? Does this drive him away any faster? Will he play again this year? How does this unfold with Kyrie Irving? Well, I, I think it's a, a good guess that they they probably hated being held hostage by Kyrie Irving's absence and his future, mm-hmm. and what he's going to decide. So they said, you know, we have Kevin Durant here and he wants us to trade for James Harden. And, uh, and the owner in Houston wants to unload salary and all the rest of that. So let's, let's do that. And now we're no longer subservient to Kyrie Irving. Like we, we can go forward with James Harden and Kevin Durant. But the bottom line is they have no chance to win unless Kyrie comes back. So at least, you know, they, they gave Durant what he wanted. They maintained the relationship with him. Um, they have two stars. So if Kyrie never comes back, they'll be representative. You know, they'll, they'll have a chance. They'll definitely, they should make the playoffs and, um, but if they want to go far, if they want this to play out the way they all dreamt it would, they're going to need Kyrie to come back. I have no idea the psychology of Kyrie Irving. I have no idea what his circumstances are right now. If there's actually a real thing driving this absence, or, you know, a real serious thing, probably not based on pictures of, of him and his family party, but you just never know. Um, but Maybe they have an idea that they just wait, wait for him to return. You know, that it's a little bit like Phil Jackson saying to Dennis Rodman, yeah, go on to Las Vegas for a few days, get your head right. I don't Mm want to do while you're there. When you come back, I'll expect you to play whenever that is, which is a true story, right? That's what happened. And they won the championship that year with Dennis Rodman as one of their key guys. He did, did come back. So, there's all sorts of stories here. This has more of an ABA kind of overtone to it than just about anything we've seen lately, ABA times 10, when you think about how much more money there is in the NBA now than there was in the ABA back then. But back, back then there were all sorts of ABA stories, right? About crazy things going and guys disappearing and uh, unexplained absences and uh, talents that had no moorings. So we've seen this before in other venues this one just as happens to be not happening in Memphis or uh, Minneapolis. This is happening in New York City um, with, uh, with three of the more enigmatic stars in the NBA. So it's, it's just a, a, the beautiful makings of a script, right? It's a, it's a Hollywood treatment where like you, you, you say what's going on in the two paragraph proposal and the producers are all leaning forward, wanting to know what happens next. <laughs> Say to them, I'm not going to tell you. I'll let you know in June what happens next. Yeah. And they're like, and that's what we're all going to be like. We're all going to be leaning forward, waiting to find out what's going to become of this. And it's it's going to be fascinating. And for, for the NBA and for the league overall, it can't lose. No matter what happens, people mm-hmm. are going to be paying attention. Uh, the only people that have something to lose here are the, are the Nets. And, you know, no one's really cared much about the Nets anyway. It's not like there are a lot of fans of the, the Nets out there. So we'll just, we just get to watch this as, as uninterested parties. Yeah, the one thing with Kyrie and, on, again, with Adam, like I'm thankful that uh, this is no longer too much of a headache for Celtics fans anymore. But this Kyrie thing, and if he wants to be a social justice advocate, I have no problem with that. I mean, that's using your platform for a good reason, you know, trying to advocate for different, uh, it, uh, you know, for, for the betterment of communities. I, that's phenomenal. I applaud that. That's no, but you do have an obligation to your teammates, an obligation to your team to let them know what's going on. And the, the longer that we don't hear from Kyrie, and, and, you know, Sean Marks wants to say, I've had conversations with Kyrie. I keep those private. That's good on Marks, you know, obviously – want to ruffle that relationship, Steve Nash, you know, doing the same thing, similar lip service, but Kyrie owes his team and his teammates an answer as to where he's, what he's doing, what he's been doing. 
And if it is because, you know, stuff at the Capitol has invoked him to go out and try and, and, and take a different stance on social justice stuff, again, I applaud him for that. That's okay. But you also signed a contract to play basketball. And that, you know, you're getting paid handsomely to do so. Now, if you want to forfeit that contract, you know, the money that he's going to forfeit, um, and, you know, that gets donated to great causes, then, again, this is ends up being a positive thing. But, you know, if Kevin Durant teamed up with Kyrie Irving to go play in Brooklyn and Kyrie's going to be AWOL and they go out and trade for Harden and Kyrie has come back and play, then this is an absolute, again, cataclysmic failure for the Brooklyn Nets. As Ian said, you will not win a title with just Durant and Harden and whatever they have left. I mean, you know, I, I, again, I love Landry Shamit. Joe Harris is a great shooter, but that's just not going to get it done, uh, never mind against the Lakers, against a lot of teams in the Eastern Conference, right? So, you know, Kyrie at some point has to come out of his, you know, radio silence here and, and just – tell everybody what's going on. And if he's communicated that with his team privately and they want to keep that private, fine. But, you know, the longer he sits out and doesn't do anything and doesn't come back to the, the team, the more resentment I think builds. And, uh, you know, at, at some point, if you're Durant, it's like, you know, I, I came back from an Achilles injury, um, you know, to team up with you in Brooklyn to try and win a championship. And if you're not going to be, you're going to bail on me already. Then, you know, what the hell am I here for? They, I, he had, Durant has every option in the world at his, at his disposal. He can go anywhere. Everybody would clear cap space if Kevin Durant's like, hey, I want to go play here. Everybody would be like, all right, we're going to get rid of everybody else and bring in Kevin Durant. So, you know, again, Kyrie, his, his passion for social justice is phenomenal. I applaud that. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to, if you, if you want to play basketball, you have to step on a court. Um, and if you want to forfeit all those things that basketball gives you to go pursue other things, totally fine with that. But at the, you know, if he owes his team an explanation and I think he owes fans an explanation. Cause I think fans and, and are, uh, uh, Nets fans are frustrated. It's like, Hey man, we, we've got invested in this team, but where are, are you invested in this team? Fans should have asked that question. You know, your GM and your coach should have asked that question. It just, it feels, you know, frustrating, but you know, once again, here we are, the, the very interesting case of Kyrie Irving and, and, and his, I hate to put it this way, but flakiness, he's a little flaky and, and, and his, his personality is that way. He, he might be aligned in certain things and I applaud that, but you know, with flaky personality sometimes, you know, uh, in, in a, a organization in a, in a sport like this, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And again, Brooklyn will go nowhere without him. So somebody has to tell Kyrie like, Hey, like we need you. If, if we don't have you, we're sunk, and that's it. Yeah, it's got to be Kevin. Kevin's got to be the one to tell him. Uh, the fans, Kyrie hits a, comes back and hits a three to win the game. All will be forgiven. He won't yep. go Fans will be fine with, with him. Fans are just as fickle as Kyrie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they just want the performance. Yeah. The, the difference between – Kyrie in Boston and Kyrie in Brooklyn is that in Boston, he was the best player and they were hoping he would be the leader. And in Brooklyn, he's their third best player, as hard as that is to believe, but he is. He's going, uh, he's behind two MVPs uh, and a guy who has arguably been, if not the best player, one of the top three players in the league in Duran and Harden was an MVP and arguably one of the greatest scorers of all time. So Kyrie's the third best player. So they don't need leadership from him. They don't need what the Celtics were asking of him. He can just show up and make shots and then go do whatever the heck he wants. He can, he can uh, champion larger causes. And um, if they're okay with him disappearing every now and then, as long as he comes back and helps them, you know, maybe that's a pact they'll make with him and understanding they'll reach with him because he's not going to be defining the culture of their team. It's going to be up to, to Durant to do that. Uh, so I, I actually think trading for Harden strengthened their position with Kyrie in that sense. You know, the Celtics really were held hostage to Kyrie. They, they pinned everything on him with their young players and he was going to be the leader and he wasn't up to it. Well, that's not the deal here. They're, they're not asking him to be that guy. They just want him to be like a field goal kicker that comes in and just makes his shots, 
you know, be the third guy like Ray Allen making his shots. And, and maybe, maybe Kyrie will demand more. Well, if you want a bigger role, if you feel like you're being disrespected, you got to earn it. You got to show up and, and do it on the court. And that'll be a simple message to him. And I think it'll resonate with him. I think it'll just make sense that if you're not doing it on the court, then how do you expect to get the respect? Well, as we uh, wrap up here in a matter of moments, ultimately, after all this shakes out, based on, you know, remove the unpredictabilities, the resilient of them from uh, an injury standpoint, a health and safety standpoint, and obviously what we just spent the last little while talking about how this Brooklyn Nets thing is going to unfold. Where are the Celtics in the Eastern Conference to you in this hierarchy with some of these, you know, certainly more talented teams, but, you know, Brooklyn is mighty combustible as well. Well, I mean, the great news is that every year, every time they go away for a little while and then they come back, uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are just better. They just keep getting better. Um, right now, both scoring, what, 26 points a game and mm -hmm. um, making plays for others, becoming better playmakers, showing leadership at both ends of the floor, really trying to, to contribute in all phases of the game they're playing like they're much older than they really are. And you know, they're not done improving yet. They're going to keep getting better. They'll be better next year than they are this year, the 24 and 22. So they're just going to keep getting better. And that's really promising. Is Jason Tatum going to be a top five, top seven player in the league? If he is, then they have a chance to, to win the championship because you need that kind of guy to be leading your team. You need somebody that's that good uh, to do it. Um, they got off to a, a nice start, thanks to a lot of last second shots. Um, and they did without Kemba Walker. So they had Kemba Walker back. If he's able to play, get through this year, what, what a great addition that would be. Um, really, though, what this season is going to come down to, because it's just so bizarre and unpredictable, and there's so little that the teams control until um, health is restored, the, the, the promise of health. Is mm -hmm. what's going to come down to is who's playing best at the end of the year. It's just going to be that simple. So if the Nets are playing really well, well, then good luck trying to beat those three guys if they're playing well. But if they aren't playing well, is it Milwaukee that's playing at a high level that has teamwork? They've been able to develop teamwork in spite of physical distancing protocols and, and all the other things that are going on. Are the Celtics really clicking? There's a Philly, you know, it, Miami. Miami's probably the most team-minded team in the East. Are they the ones that are playing a high level? Who's, uh, who has the sum of the parts going at that time of the year? That's what it's going to come down to. And right now it's just impossible to predict. There's a lot of teams that have a chance. When they get to the finals, if the Lakers are healthy, no one's gonna beat them unless it's Brooklyn in terms of talent. So. As far as getting out of the East, though, it's just such a wild card. Um, but the Celtics are right there with a chance to do it if they're playing at a high level. Well, I know we went Nets heavy today, folks, but uh, how can you not? I mean, that trade totally shakes up the landscape of the conference, and certainly there are a lot of direct – Celtics tie-ins to that. I think uh, all of us probably, I think I'm speaking for all of us pretty easily, are – maybe relieved that James Harden isn't a member of the Boston Celtics right now, at least pending what that trade would have looked like. But based on reports that were out there for a little while, you know, I, I just don't see how he would have been an upgrade, even with his talent based on what Boston would have had to lose in the process. And so here we are, you know, the March toward uh, actually finishing this season continues, as we know, health and safety, it's paramount. That takes precedence over all else. And hopefully, uh, you know, a, a, question marks in that department won't require a stoppage you know i know people want to watch games but league has to do what it has to do to keep everybody as safe as uh, humanly possible in this very unpredictable time but uh, at, at the very least uh, there's no question evan ian the uh, uh this game is wildly entertaining and this league is wildly entertaining and it just never stops i mean you wake up yesterday it's basically the nba trade deadline with all those moves going around it was great yeah, I loved it. I think, and I still think, you know, as, as Ian talked about, C's are going to, they're a favorite to come out of the East, especially with how volatile Brooklyn can be. 
and the unity that Boston seems to have. And the one thing that we all have to remember here is, you know, Brooklyn just got better, but everybody else is probably going to try and make moves too. I mean, we look at that Houston thing now. I mean, that's ripe for anybody. I mean, Eric Gordon, PJ mm-hmm. Tucker, um, I know they just signed Christian Wood, but he makes a lot of money. And, you know, I'm not sure when he's trade eligible, but he's he had a great start to the year and could probably help out mm-hmm. somebody. Um, and as the, you know, the, the league continues and as more teams fall towards the bottom, you're going to have a little bit more clarity on who will, will be available at the trade deadline for teams to get better. I mean, Brooklyn made, you know, they made their pitch now because James Harden basically was just like, I'm out of here. And Philly and Brooklyn both tried to acquire him. Obviously Brooklyn gets it done, but everybody else can get better too. And so, you know, you look at Boston and what they could potentially offer to get somebody and the, the, the pieces they already have. I mean, they, that's an attractive place in terms of uh, competing for a title. They have as good of a shot as anybody. I think if, as long as Kemp is healthy, um, I, I, you know, I don't think they're the, the, the favorite to come out of the East right now because of that talent, but I don't think they're too far behind, you know, Philly, I don't totally trust because Philly's never really gotten it done in the playoffs. You know, either as Boston, they haven't gotten to the finals yet, but they have a little more postseason success than Philly does. The Bucs, I won't buy it until Budenholzer decides to play Giannis more than 35 minutes a game. And we've seen Mike Budenholzer's teams in the past, you know, you know, wither away in the, in, in the, in the postseason. And then we have the Miami Heat who continue to, uh, you know, play good team basketball. Those guys will get better. They'll make a trade because, you know, Pat Riley's going to find somebody. So, you know, as, as we sit here uh, after the day after the, the James Harden trade and we say Brooklyn's, you know, the top team, which they are, I don't think the gap is that big um, right now. And it could be even smaller after the trade deadline with, some, with the way that some of these teams can make moves. So I, I'm, I'm as much as I want the league to maybe shut down and, and get their health, you know, uh, straightened out. I cannot wait to see how this year unfolds because again, we just, the East has gotten even more interesting and it was already interesting before this even happened. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly excited for the, the rest of the year. Well, uh, this is fun fellas. You know, I'm just looking at some of the media availability today. Brad Stevens talking about this will be a season of curveballs. Well, yeah, <laughs> last year, at least, uh, you know, bubble life, you know, after the March stoppage and once they picked up and here we are again, it's going to be this way for a little while. Ian, always great having you on. We really appreciate your expertise, your experience, your knowledge, your uh, insights. It's, it's a, uh, it's a treat for us every time. So thank you for hopping on. Uh, thanks for having me. By the way, I wouldn't have minded seeing James Harden on the Celtics. Ah, well, we'll have to save that for the next time. <laughs> Just as long as it didn't cost them Jalen Brown, right? Jalen and Jason. Yeah. And cause I think, I think they could have played together. Boy, it's, in another world, we'll hook up the video game and simulate it. For Ian Thompson, for Evan Valenti, I'm Adam Kaufman. Thanks for joining us. This has been Celtic Speed and good news, at least as things stand right now. Next time we chat, Celtics will have played some games. We'll be able to talk about those. Till then. Oh, yeah.